All right, next is Chris Hannigan, who's going to talk to us about interventions in transplant patients. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, for everybody, for having me. Thanks for uh, everybody sticking around for the last session. Uh, kind of a little bit off the program here, if you're looking at your program. We're not going to do the, the, the GI bleed uh, talk, since that was covered very well by Dr. Thompson in the last session. I'm going to talk about transplant, and then Brett's going to finish it up with the last talk of the day. Uh, let me get my... My bearings here. What's the clicker? This one. I'm going to talk about uh, catheter-directed uh, techniques in liver transplantation. Uh, uh, Tom and Kevin's talk were very scientific. Mine is not. Mine's more of show and tell. So, here we go. Buckle up. Uh, chronic liver disease uh, is a uh, is a major problem. Uh, we see it. Uh, a lot at our institution. I'm, see, I'm sure you see it at your institutions as well. It's the 12th leading uh, cause of death, but we know the impact of liver disease is much more than death rates. And uh, liver transplantation over the last uh, 20, 25 years has shown to be an important tool in treating patients with this problem uh, who otherwise would uh, uh, expire from their disease. Uh, first liver transplant was uh, performed in a human in 1963, but it took some time to have uh, a single one-year survival in 1967. In the 70s, it was still pretty much uh, considered an experimental therapy. However, uh, with the advent of improving anti-rejection regimens, uh, the, the survival rates have been increasing over time and now is accepted as definitive therapy for end-stage liver disease with uh, one-year survival over 80%. Uh, since uh, 1988, uh, 125, uh, approximately 125,000 liver transplantations have been performed in the U.S. Uh, MUSC has provided this service for almost 1,200 patients since 1990, and uh, our transplant service currently does between 60 and 80 liver transplantations every year. Uh, in those patients, we're, uh, we're privileged to, uh, to help them maintain the viability of their grafts with uh, um, multiple uh, minimally invasive uh, procedures uh, uh, in patients that have complications along the way. Uh, the majority of the work we do in liver transplantation is focused on anastomotic complications, the anastomoses uh, you know, of the artery, uh, artery, uh, portal vein, uh, systemic vein, IVC, and biliary can all have their uh, variant and sundry problems, and, and, and we're always uh, available to help uh, our transplant surgeons uh, wherever possible. We also do other things in the liver that we would do in any other uh, liver. Uh, but uh, for the most part, uh, the problems tend to reside uh, near uh, a surgical connection. Uh, there's variations in all the anastomoses and liver transplants. I could spend my entire time talking about all the different vari variabilities that are possible. I'm not going to do that. Uh, uh, the key of knowing that there are a lot of variations is knowing uh, what the recipient anatomy is before you tackle the problem. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we have to have direct communication with the operating surgeon to, to, to kind of plan what we're going to encounter before we encounter it. Uh, if they're not available or, or, or they can't remember, it's been so long, uh, operative notes are, are, are very helpful. Uh, and, and if we've been in there before, we have some cross-sectional imaging, we always review that beforehand as well. Uh, Radiological sur surveillance of our liver transplants post-operative. Ultrasound does the, the vast majority of this work, measuring velocities, uh, measuring resistive ind indices, uh, evaluating flow, stenoses, uh, uh, fluid collections, and whatnot. Uh, nuclear scintigraphy can be very helpful in determining uh, biliary problems, bio leaks in, 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 in particular. Uh, occasionally, they go to MRI or CT. We don't see that a whole lot unless uh, uh, they have some problem that's uh, brought to light by ultrasound. And then finally, it, it comes to us. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about, I know this is an endovascular meeting, I'm going to talk about biliary really quick since it's the most frequent complication uh, in, in our liver transplant patients. Uh, oftentimes it, 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 it occurs in people that have an hepatic artery uh, compromised at the same time since the biliary system and transplant is dependent on the uh, hepatic arterial flow to, to maintain its viability. These patients usually present with persistent jaundice or, or bile coming out of their post-operative drains. Uh, uh, a key thing to know in transplant patients, they can be obstructed without biliary dilation. Uh, uh, 
and it's an odd finding in liver transplants, but just because people aren't um, uh, dilated uh, doesn't mean they're not obstructed. Sometimes we have to go with the uh, results of scintigraphy or, or, uh, or their labs. Anastomotic strictures are relatively common, up to 15%. Most of these are asymptomatic. Uh, 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 fewer of these are symptomatic and require our assistance in, in order to uh, maintain biliary drainage. Uh, bile leak is a common problem in people uh, uh, with uh, strictures. Uh, they happen at the same time, and biloma requiring drainage happens in, a, in almost half of all the bile leaks that we see. Uh, first case, 67-year-old woman, uh, post-op day eight with fever and bacteremia, uh, going under routine ultrasound, saw fluid collection adjacent to the left liver, uh, left lobe of the liver by ultrasound. Uh, they've got a CT. Let me get my pointer here, showing uh, large fluid collection outside the liver in the region of the porta hepatis. Uh, uh, is uh, known to be bilious. Uh, we do a PTC. This is mainly staining from the non, trying to find one of these non-dilated ducts and, and search, searching with a Sheba needle. Uh, you can see the stent that was uh, put in uh, by uh, the transplant surgeon at the time of surgery. And here is a large uh, extravasation of, of uh, bile near the uh, anastomosis. Uh, we managed to get an internal external biliary drain to divert flow around away from the bile leak. We attach this to external drainage and, uh, and, and we like to have bile going into the bowel so they don't get too dehydrated and they, they retain their, all the reasons for them to have bile in their bowel in the first place. Uh, but we, the, the, main, the main reason here is just to divert flow, give the bile an easier place to go except for outside the hole of the anastomosis. Over time, you can see on CT that the fluid collection is gone. They come back from time to time. We like to follow these drains every four weeks to maintain their patency. They tend to get clogged over time. Uh, this was after, after a couple of follow-ups. We can see that the bile leak is, has resolved uh, and uh, we removed uh, the internal external biliary drain and this patient did well. Uh, second case, 58-year-old woman, two weeks outside of transplantation with a decreased H&H &H on Lovenox, thought to have an, an abdominal hematoma, have an ultrasound, uh, tried to evaluate the size of it, and during the ultrasound, they also saw fluid underneath the liver with gas in it. They thought it might be an abscess. Uh, they got a CT. There's air and fluid collection in the porta hepatis. We put a, a biloma drain in directly as it's in the gallbladder fossa. We would do it as the same way we would do a percutaneous cholecystostomy, but in this case, there's no gallbladder there anymore. And it was biliary. Uh, they went to nuclear medicine and we, they, the, the liver took up the, the agent very well and, and you could see uh, activity in the drain itself. So they knew that it was a bile leak. We went for PTC for diversion again, showing moderately dilated uh, bile ducts, here's our bileoma tube down here, a large extravasation of, of bile out here, and uh, another internal external biliary drain diverting flow, bring them back for routine follow-up. The bile leak is gone, but we can see that there's an anastomotic stricture. We didn't treat it at this time since it was still a fairly fresh anastomosis, and she is still, uh, we just did this about a, a couple of weeks ago, and the plan for her is to start dilating this anastomosis every four weeks until it resolves. Uh, now getting into more uh, uh, exciting things, the hepatic artery. This is the key uh, to maintaining uh, graft viability. Uh, problems with the hepatic artery can be disastrous. Uh, uh, we see occlusive problems, we see stenotic problems, we see kinking of the artery due to its redundancy, thrombosis. Uh, we just can have poor flow even though it's not obstructed by some steel phenomena. We see pseudoaneurysms due to anastomotic breakdowns. Uh, fistulas uh, occur, especially in patients that have had biopsies. Uh, the hepatic artery is, is vital to the su survival of the graft, uh, and it's a tricky place to work. Uh, endovascular uh, work in, in, in anybody else's liver is relatively, I wouldn't say it's relatively routine, but you know, the more you do it, the, the better you get at it. But in, in, the, uh, in, in liver transplants, when you start working in the, the, the donor side of the artery, it, it, it'll spasm just by looking at it uh, the wrong way. And any vigorous manipulation will cause it to, to just uh, shut down. So I like to work with a micro, micro platform, an 018 or 014 platform, especially when I'm coming from 
the native side over to the donor side. Uh, early vascularization uh, results in high salvage rates of these grafts. And uh, let's go over a few cases. Here's a 62 year old woman, three days out from liver transplant uh, for Nash cirrhosis with elevated LFTs. Ultrasound shows a uh, markedly elevated resistive index with little to no diastolic flow. Um, and here we are. We have a celiac angiogram, and uh, we can see good flow over here to a, a large spleen. Uh, it's taking most of the flow away from the liver. And here's the hepatic artery. There's a a question of a, a stenosis right here, but we can see that the flow to the splenic side is much greater than the flow to the uh, hepatic side. These sides should be equal, and they are clearly not here. Here's a, uh, about 15 seconds later, we can see uh, the hepatic artery is uh, now getting into the liver parenchyma, and so is the portal vein. Uh, the, the portal vein sh uh, flow should not beat the hepatic artery flow to uh, the liver. Uh, question is it because of this problem here or is it because this, the spleen is just stealing most of the blood away from the liver? We measured uh, pressures across this spot right here. There was no significant gradient there. We uh, thought it was probably most likely due to a splenic steal, so we coiled the splenic artery to make the flow go over to the liver. Uh, the spleen will stay alive by other pathways and a follow-up angiogram shows more uh, uniform flow to the spleen in the arterial side uh, after, uh, after, after uh, taking away this and making the blood go to the liver. This happens uh, a lot in, in, in very resistant livers, very edematous livers, um, and this patient did well. A 41-year-old male, elevated LFTs, uh, hepatic artery stenosis on MRI at a deep outside institution that was, uh, was, uh, was obtained because of uh, a d decrease in the resistive index on ultrasound. Uh, again, this looks like the other one, except there's no steel. Here's the splenic side, here's the hepatic side. The blood's getting into the liver fine. Uh, again, there's, this is the redundancy of the hepatic artery. What's the problem right here? There's the anastomosis right there. Uh, we get closer to it and it's, it's kind of overlapped on each other. Sometimes the hardest part of doing angio on these is opening up this redundant part of the, of the surgical site. Uh, we managed to do that. There's a, a stenosis here. The question is, is it significant or not? Uh, we get a, I got a microcatheter across that and there was a, 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 a systolic gradient of 29 millimeters of mercury, which we thought was fairly significant, so we put a, a balloon uh, on that right here. You can see the waste of the balloon, and we improved flow and decreased uh, uh, the systolic gradient to seven millimeters of mercury, and this patient did well. Uh, another case, 56-year-old woman, uh, two weeks out from liver transplantation due to hep, uh, hep C. Uh, she has a, a direct graft from the aorta to the liver and no arterial waveforms were seen on ultrasound and she was doing quite poorly. Um, uh, here we have a reverse curve catheter into the, uh, into the uh, hepatic artery directly implanted under the aorta with no flow and a large filling defect, only just seeing the out, outline of the conduit. Uh, this is a, a complete thrombosis of the hepatic artery. Uh, it was difficult to get a, a wire by there. Finally, we got a microcatheter uh, through that section and into the uh, um, donor hepatic artery with a stenosis uh, here, and no, very, very no flow, no flow at all. Um, uh, we uh, put an angiojet thrombectomy device to try to get as much clot out as we could. We've got this picture. We still see a stenosis here and some clot back here. The aorta is back here somewhere. Um, so we decided to balloon that stenosis to see if we could make it better. There's our balloon, and now we have uh, more. We have direct flow in there, but we still have all these filling defects in here. And back here, it looks a mess. I think we probably dissected that a little bit. I know we did, and uh, and so we decided to stent that and tack it down, and uh, so we put a stent at the origin of the implant onto the aorta, and now we have nice forward flow into the liver. She did well for a little while. Uh, we'll talk about her a little bit later when we get to the venous side of things. Uh, 
Another case, 69-year-old male, 10 weeks post-op liver transplant for uh, uh, HCC. Now with graft versus host disease, an enlarging hepatic arterial pseudoaneurysm, a very poor operative candidate. He's still in the hospital. We just did this case last week. Uh, here is his ultrasound showing a large pseudoaneurysm underneath the left side of the liver. Thought it might be or coming from the left uh, a hepatic artery, got a CT, and it was, it was right before the bifurcation of a very redundant hepatic artery in the donor uh, segment. Here's the pseudoaneurysm right here. Uh, they couldn't operate on them. Uh, you can see here the hepatic artery is a replaced hepatic artery coming off the SMA with a stenosis uh, right here. Uh, later phase shows uh, the pseudoaneurysm right there. Uh, we got access with a sheath showing uh, the, uh, the large pseudoaneurysm with flow into the liver on the other side of it after we opened it up. We put a covered Viabon stent across that and it looked pretty good. We thought we were golden. This only took about five minutes, six minutes tops, and we were all congratulating ourselves. And then we looked at the picture and said, oh, there's still some flow in that pseudoaneurysm. And what are we going to do? Well, we took some more pictures, and we saw it was uh, analogous to a type 1 endo leak. There was leaking around the top of the uh, stent graft back into the pseudoaneurysm. So oh, all we have to do is extend this a half a centimeter, and then we can go home. This was Friday, and it was late. And we got our Viabon up. Now we have no flow in the liver. Oh, oh God, this guy's going to die now because they can't operate and he's got no flow in the hepatic artery. And uh, so it took us a while to figure it out. And we were dissecting with our sheath back here during this time. So we fixed the pseudoaneurysm, but we caused a problem back here. So we extended our stenting all the way back to the origin of the SMA. And we, uh, we preserved flow into the hepatic artery. At this point, we're doing hand injections because we've used so much contrast along the way. But the ultrasound the next day shows uh, forward flow into the liver with good resistive indices and no uh, pseudoaneurysm. And he's doing well because of his, of his problem, but he's doing quite poorly because of his graft versus host. And um, he's in dire straits right now, but uh, we're taking it day by day with this guy. Uh, uh, there's a, uh, this is another case. I don't know the age uh, of this patient. This was increased portal venous flow seen on ultrasound after a biopsy. Uh, hepatic artery angiogram showing the uh, hepatic artery coming into the liver and nice filling of the portal vein at the very same time with no flow into the liver. This is a, um, uh, a fistula due to the biopsy, an arterial portal vein fistula. Uh, we need to you, we need to maintain as much hepatic artery as we can, so we search for the culprit vessel, which was coming off of uh, uh, one of the one of the right uh, hepatic artery branches. We managed to get some coils in there, preserve flow to the majority of the liver while taking away the uh, the portal the uh, arterial portal fistula. Uh, coming into the uh, an, another another part of the liver now, we'll talk about the sy systemic veins. Uh, uh, problems in this area are quite rare, less than 1%, but, uh, and oftentimes they're delayed. We don't see them right away like we do with the arteries or the bile ducts. These are oftentimes three, four, five years out. Uh, they have lower, le typically they present with ascites, or lower extremity edema. Uh, he, uh, the, the veins always look weird. Uh, so it's, hemodynamics are, are very important in, in, in finding if these are really problems that need to be addressed or do they have some problem with their liver or somewhere else. Uh, plastine, stent, lysis, the typical things we do. Uh, do you come from the neck? Do you come from the leg? Coming from the neck is easier, especially if you want to evaluate the hepatic veins if they're coming off a piggybacked IVC. Uh, we can come from the groin. A lot of times coming from the neck is impossible because these people have renal problems as well. They have dialysis catheters in there or they've had a lot of catheters up there and everything's occluded. Uh, so planning on how you're going to get to where you want to get here is uh, oftentimes very important. Uh, here's a case. This is the same patient as the arterial conduit case with thrombosis that we opened. There was a question of thrombus on the ultrasound in the veins. Here's uh, coming from above, uh, coming into the, uh, from the uh, IVC, from the right atrium of the IVC into the uh, liver transplant. We 
uh, do a venogram here and you can just see the holdup of flow. There was no clot in here, but there was stasis uh, and there was a, a seven millimeter uh, gradient bet between the uh, hepatic veins and the right atrium here. Uh, so we decided that uh, that was uh, not normal. We put a, I think this is a 10 millimeter balloon. You can see the waste right there. Um, and we opened this up with no holdup of venous flow. Uh, she had a, so she, this is a patient had a problem on the arterial side. Now she has a problem on the venous side. We managed to fix both of her problems in the short term uh, with uh, endovascular techniques, but she ended up dying a few months later after this. Um, this is a 44-year-old man with persistent ascites. Uh, this is uh, uh, actually, this is a, a case that Renan uh, shared with me for a prior talk. Uh, this was in 1999, a year before I got to MUSC. It was a patient with an IVC occlusion uh, who was uh, balloon dilated, uh, had, a, had a significant gradient, and so required stenting since it was resistant to angioplasty alone, and a nice stent was here and reduced the gradient. Patient came back for a follow-up one year later. The stenosis has come back because the stent is now in the heart. And uh, Renan uh, went up in there and uh, got the stent but could not retrieve it and the patient had to have open heart surgery to have the uh, stent removed. Uh, then nobody really wanted to mess with this area. <laughs> and they call, they call me, I think Renan shared this case with me because they called me saying, would you be willing to put another stent in there? And I go, I don't think so. And, uh, and the last one went to the heart. And uh, so I ballooned it and it didn't get better and then Renan got some Z stents and he put them in there and the patient did quite well after that. Uh, portal vein complications, uh, 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 the stenosis uh, is uh, uh, about 3% of the time. Uh, a lot of times they're uh, clinically insignificant, uh, but if they're tight, uh, we can angioplasty those. We can put stents in though, but plasty tends to be the treatment of choice here. Uh, thrombosis of the portal vein occurs as well and can be catastrophic. In those cases, we can do direct lysis directly on the clot. We can do mechanical thrombectomy or we can do indirect lysis from the SMA down and let it go around and around and, and work on the clot on, on the portal side of things. In the portal vein, a lot of the challenge is just getting into the portal vein. That's half the battle is do we come IJ, do we come transhepatic, how do we want to get in there? Uh, here's a 43-year-old man, uh, one month uh, post-op uh, transplantation, increasing LFTs and dilated portal vein on ultrasound and there was a question of a stenosis. Uh, it's dilated here, it's dilated there, it looks funny in the middle. Uh, who knows what's going on? We measured pressures. There's a six millimeter gradient. Is that a significant portal gradient? Who knows? Uh, I think it probably is. It shouldn't be that great from one side to the other. Uh, we put a balloon on it. There was a waste on the balloon. Uh, we were done. It looks about the same. Maybe, maybe it looks a little bit better. The gradient's only one millimeter now. Uh, so we congratulated ourselves. Uh, he didn't get better. Uh, he kind of got better for, for a little while and the stenosis came back on cross-sectional imaging. He ended up having to go back to surgery for a portal vein reconstruction and he's doing quite well now. Uh, here's a four-year-old uh, female, one month post-transplantation with gastric varix bleeding, question of portal stenosis. Here's a CT, this question of a stenosis or occlusion of the portal vein right there. Uh, there's clearly a tight stenosis of the portal vein right at the anastomosis with large uh, gastric varices here. Uh, we put a balloon on this and she did quite well and she needed no further treatment. Uh, we're keeping a close eye on her though. Uh, a 59 year old woman, two month uh, post transplant for Nash cirrhosis with persistent ascites and question portal stenosis. Uh, it, this is uh, like the other one except for she had ascites so we're coming from the IJ instead of transhepatic and it looks a lot like the first one. Uh, there was a significant gradient and we dilated it uh, but even when we were done there were still varices and uh, even though there was no gradient here we were hoping that these would go away and uh, they didn't but we couldn't fix this any better than it was already did uh, or than we already did and she died waiting for another transplant. 62-year-old uh, uh, female, 
one week post-op uh, transplantation with no portal flow on ultrasound. Uh, came from a transhepatic approach here is complete thrombosis of the portal venous system. Uh, uh, we uh, got in here with a mechanical thrombectomy device and took out as much clot as we could. Uh, she, we could not lyse her because she was bleeding uh, in other places and she died two weeks later uh, waiting for a transplant as well. So even though we have technical successes a lot of times these patients still are quite ill and don't make it. Uh, 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 I think this is the last case, left lobe transplant in a little girl with portal thrombosis. Uh, getting in transhepatic, she had a partial liver, just the left side of her liver, uh, since she was just a, uh, a child. Uh, we got directly in there, there's flow through all these varices and no flow into the portal system. Uh, she was bleeding from those varices. We ballooned the portal vein in order to restore patency the best we could, and we coiled all the, the varices that we could. There was still some clot in here, so she underwent uh, lysis uh, for a day and, 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 and now is doing quite well. We haven't had to re-intervene on her, and I think this was, I think, four or five years ago. So. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, liver transplantation offers a solution to some patients with end-stage liver disease with increasing survival rates over the last two decades, and complications are going down. We're getting better and better at this over time, uh, but uh, interventional radiology pro pro provides a very important service in maintaining graft viability in, in a lot of these patients, and uh, just uh, an old friend of mine, uh, thinking back two days ago what was going on. Uh, told me this when I was a young attending. I love the liver. I love everything about it. There's so much good work we can do in there. And uh, he did this after a normal PTC. So he just, he just loved it. So, thank you. <laughs>